we can be turning back to Romans chapter 3. <laughs> I think it was a late start this morning. But... I just think I'll have to go a little earlier this time. There you go. <laughs> Romans chapter 3, verse 20 through 22, I'd like to look at over one of the day. Sometimes it's hard when we're through here to stop because Paul just kind of keeps building upon thought upon thought. But verse number 20, he says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in the sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Amen. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all of them that believe, for there is no difference. Amen. If you recall, we've seen how man is wicked and depraved and sinful. And verse 19, how man is guilty before God because man has violated the law of God. That's where we pick up in verse number 20. He says, therefore, because of these things, because man is wicked and guilty before God, because man has been tainted by sin from the crown of his head to the sole of his foot, because man is a transgressor of the law and under its condemnation, he says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. It is by the deeds of the law, it's by the, the keeping of the law, by obeying its commandments, following all the thou shalts and thou shalt not. So even if we were bold all the way down to just the Ten Commandments, just keeping those things cannot justify man in the sight of God. You're right. And those are things that are good to keep and to live by, and it would do our society good if we could just follow the, the basic Ten Commandments. But none of those things will make one right before God. Amen. Well, he says that by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That there is no flesh that shall be justified in his sight. <clears throat> tells that no man, that no creature can justify himself by his own works. Amen. Man has said he's been pronounced guilty because of his violation of the law, so there's no way he can justify himself by the law. <laughs> Man in his natural state cannot justify himself by any amount of good works. Amen. So I think sometimes we, or at least man, forgets that no amount of good works he does is ever going to outweigh the bad which he has done. He's never going to be able to do enough deeds of the law to correct or to right all his violations of the law. You know? We like to think that we can do no good and that will outweigh our bad. Or, or legally, we try to think if we do enough good and the little things won't matter. Right? But yet, in the sight of God, just to break the least of the commandments, James says we're guilty of all. Amen. Yeah. Because man is a violator of God's law, he will never be able to justify himself. Through God's law. Right. And he says here that there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. That is, this flesh is never going to be justified. That's why it must be changed one day. Amen. First Corinthians 15 outlines that change, how the flesh and blood shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This corruptible will go on in corruption, this mortal will go on immortality, and shall be brought to pass the same death that swallowed up in the victory. Mad. Well, that is when we'll be fully justified right in the sight of God. But yeah. this flesh is not going to be justified. It will be changed into a, a perfect body, a body that's free from sin, a body that, I think Galatians describes it as like unto his glorious body. But there is no flesh that's going to be justified in the sight of God. Right. And this word justified, I think we're probably all familiar with it. We looked at it some in chapter 2. But it means that we're 
who've been rendered innocent or righteous in the sight of God. Legally, this is the definition of justification. It's a legal excuse for the performance or non-performance of a particular act that is the basis for exemption from guilt. A classic example is the excuse of self-defense offered as justification for the commission of a murder. So justification means that we're free from the guilt of the law. And yet man in of himself will never be free of that guilt of the law. Amen. When we stand before God in and of ourselves, we'll have no excuse. When we stand before, man stands before God, if he's not been born again, if he's not been saved, if he's not in Christ, whatever term you want to use, he will not have an excuse to plead when he stands there at the judgment. Amen. When man's court of law, we make excuses and explanations and justifications, but Man in himself will not be able to do any such thing when he stands before the judgment seat of God. Right. So we have no excuse under his law, but verse 19 says it's already declared us guilty. Really, we've already been declared guilty. We're just waiting for the sentence. Amen. So verse 20 21, verse 21 and 22 tell us that there is an alternative. But before we get to there, he says there, so no flesh be justified in his sight, that's in, in the sight of God. Before man, we may be able to justify ourselves by our, our good works, but we'll never be able to justify ourselves in the sight of God. Amen. We'll get to that a little bit in chapter 4 when we look at Abraham, how he was justified by faith, but also justified by works. And that's a, something we can look forward to in a few more lessons, but you can be sure in the sight of God our works will never justify us. Amen. That I might appear righteous to man, I might appear to be a good, moral, upstanding citizen, but yet if I've never been born again, I'm still guilty in the sight of God. You're right. And Paul says that this is evident for in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3, we'll turn there and read that real quick. It's evident, let me just clear, it's obvious that man is not justified by the law. And Galatians goes very good hand in hand with, especially this part of Romans, because the whole Galatian letter is dealing primarily with the law and our relationship to the law in Christ. And if you're familiar with Galatians, we're trying to go back underneath the law. Paul right. in one place says they had fallen from grace. That means they had left off grace and were seeking to justify themselves by the law. Right. But Galatians 3 verse 11 says that, but that no man is justified by the law on the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Amen. But the law is good and has its use, but as we'll see, the law is never our means of justification. He says, here the just shall live by faith. And we see that quoted in several places in scriptures. As we'll see in the next verse, our justification comes through faith in Christ, not anything that we can do. Right. In the last part of verse 20, he says, for by the law is the knowledge of the sin. Mm -hmm. The law is never meant to save us, rather it shows us our exceeding sinfulness, it shows us our, our need for a Savior. We'll see this more in Romans chapter 7, when Paul describes his struggle with good versus evil. He said, if it had not been for the law, he would not have known sin. But Amen. If the law had not said, thou shalt covet, he would not have known lust. And the law just shows us how wicked we really are, how how far short, or how short we come of being God's standard of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Really a right understanding of the law and ourselves will show us that we fall very, very short of the righteousness of God. You're right. right. 
Again, in Galatians 3, 24, we see that the law was not meant to save us, but rather to show us this need of a Savior. But after he said that this, we are all under sin, in verse 22, he tells us in verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Amen. See, the law pointed us to Christ. The law taught us that we were sinners in need of a Savior. The law could not justify, but rather he says that we might be justified by faith. Really, justification has always been by faith, even going back to Abraham. Yet there are many, many today that think they can keep keep the law, they can do no big works, and that will justify them in the sight of God. Mm -hmm. Yet over and over in scriptures, we see that those things are not sufficient, that only faith in Christ is sufficient for justification. Let's go back to our text, and we'll go on to verse 21. He says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Amen. The righteousness of God without the law, he says, that's. <laughs> we see in the Old Testament how that God displayed his standard of righteousness through the law, through its commandments and stipulations, how you had to do this and you couldn't do that. And if you broke any of those, you were guilty before God. And as, uh, as we saw last week, all that are outside of Christ are under that law and are guilty before God. No man is able to attain to that perfect state of righteousness in himself. Amen. That God's righteousness is perfect and without sin. That's what we see. That's how we... God displays his righteousness through the law that it requires perfect sinlessness. And that is the righteousness that he possesses, that it is perfect and without sin, and without influence of sin or human emotion, without a bad thing. But it's thus saith the Lord. It is We live in a day where there's lots of, quote, gray areas. People say, well, I don't know. The Bible doesn't really say this or that. But the law always said black and white. It's this way or it's that way. Amen. Mm -hmm. And as far as the standard of God's righteousness, that was mm -hmm. how God chose to reveal his righteousness through the law. But it showed us that we could not attain to that level of righteousness. Right. But now he says there is a righteousness without the law. That is, it's without our keeping of the law. It's without our deeds of the law. But rather, it's through the person of Christ. He says, now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. So this righteousness, which is now revealed unto us in the New Testament time, is not dependent upon us keeping it perfectly, but rather it's dependent upon Christ and his perfect people of it. Amen. We, if it was up to us to keep the law perfectly for our righteousness, then we would all fall short. You're right. You know, even the Old Testament saints had to have faith in God. We'll see that. So when we get to Abraham, we see Abel had faith. We see Enoch had faith. Noah had faith. And it wasn't Faith is not necessarily a New Testament idea. But the Old Testament saints, they, they primarily stood in God's righteousness through the law. Amen. Through the, in that light, they could see God's righteousness, but yet we see God's righteousness through the person of Christ. Yeah. It doesn't mean God's righteousness has changed. It doesn't mean that he has lowered his standards, but rather, if anything, he has made it or accessible to his people. Mm -hmm. There's many today that seem to be going back to the same way the Galatians were, trying to tell you you got to keep the law in its perfectness and do all this and make sure you follow it to a T or you're not 
going to be saved when you stand before God. But yet God provided a better way for us, he says in Hebrews. Amen. That is, we can have righteousness before God through the person of Christ. So even the Old Testament saints were not cloaked in Christ's righteousness until he came and made the sacrifice. And that is why they went to paradise rather than directly in the presence of God. Right. Because yes, they were they were saved in this but yet they were not saved in the same sense, I guess they could say. You know, I would sometimes like to look at the what some people call dispensations of God's grace and of salvation, but yet you can be sure faith has always been required for salvation. Amen. But yet things had to come to pass in the fullness of time. Even for us, we are saved, but we will not be fully complete until we drop this flesh and put on that new body. Right. Just like the Old Testament saints were, were saved, but yet they did not possess all that we do under the new covenant because Christ had not made a sacrifice yet. But yet we have, as he says here, the righteousness of God without the law manifest. That is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, verse 22. He says, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That is the law and the prophets affirmed Christ and his righteousness. They, they pointed to it. They predicted it. They told us of his coming and his, of his perfectness. If you recall, we a while back studied just one aspect of that, his sacrifice in the Old Testament, and how it was foreshadowed and how it was typified in the Old Testament sacrifices. But really, the, the whole Old Testament all the law and the prophets point to Christ. Amen. We see it in the book of Daniel and Isaiah. We see it in Psalms. We see it all the way back to Genesis 3. But the Old Testament always points to Christ. Amen. Going back to our last point, that it was meant to be a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was always meant to point one to Christ, not to... Not to oneself. That's where the Pharisees got things wrong. They thought by keeping the law, by you know, doing all the deeds of the law, they could be righteous in and of themselves. Mm. Rather, the law was always meant to point us to the Messiah, the Savior. Amen. If you remember the prayer of the, the Pharisee or in Luke, he, he prayed and said, you know, I thank the God I'm not as other men are, as adulterers, or even as this Pharisee, he said, I tithe twice, or at least I fast twice a week, I tithe of all that I possess. He, he boasted about all that he was and was not in the law. Even Paul, when he described himself before the Lord saved him, he was, he had a lot to boast about. He was as touching the law, blameless, he says. And yet, after the Lord saved him, he said he desired not to be found having his own righteousness, but the righteousness which of Christ had. So righteousness before God must be through the person of Christ, otherwise it will be far, far short of what God requires. We can go up to verse 22 and we'll draw this to a close here. He says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and the, unto all and upon all them that believe, that there is no difference. Amen. So here it is the key that is by faith of Jesus Christ. That this righteousness cannot come by any other means. Rather, it must be that we have faith in Christ and his righteousness through his perfect obedience and his willing sacrifice. And it's not our obedience, but rather it was his obedience. And it's not our righteousness, but rather it was his righteousness. Amen. But that gets a little bit into what some people call imputation, which is talked about later on here in the book of Romans. 
our sin was imputed unto his account, his righteousness was imputed unto our account. Right. That God was pleased to use Christ to become sin for us. And just please place the righteousness of Christ upon us that we might be righteous in his sight. Now we've talked a lot about righteousness today, and that simply means to be right before God. To do that which is right according to his standards, according to his word. Well, I know today, by and large, the teaching is just do what feels good, do what you think is right, but mm -hmm. real righteousness can only come through Christ. Mm -hmm. Man can only understand it through God's Word. Man always has shifting standards of what is right and what is wrong, but yet God has not changed what is right and wrong. The scriptures might be looked as on as outdated or old fashioned, but yet they're still the only true standard of what is righteousness and what is not righteousness. Amen. A man likes to add his own thinkings and philosophies to it or try to say, well, that was just the Old Testament. It doesn't matter now because we're not under the law. And it is true that to be righteous in the sight of God, we cannot look at anything that we can do, but yet God still has his standard of righteousness revealed in his word. Amen. The problem with uh, those such as the Campbellites and others that teach you have to hold out faithful to be saved as they condition their salvation upon what they are doing. Right. Yet that's not how God salvation works. You're right. If we're trusting in what we're doing or not doing in order to keep our salvation, then we're trusting in something other than Christ. Really, we're trusting in our good works to keep us saved. Right. And yet, our trust for salvation ought to be fully and completely in the person of Christ and what He has accomplished. If he has begun a good work in us, he will perform on the day of Jesus Christ, the scriptures say. Amen. He never said that he will begin a good work in you and you must finish it. Or it's up to you to keep it or anything like that. But notice we see here in verse 22 that how we obtain and how we possess the righteousness of God by faith in Jesus Christ. It says, unto all and upon all of them that believe. To believe is really the only requirement he places upon that. It's not do enough good works or be a good person or join a certain church or be baptized. It's unto all upon all that believe. Amen. When he that truly believe in Christ, he that have faith in Christ, then they will have that righteousness of Christ applied unto them. So there's no other requirements listed, is there? Amen. Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's still the really still the salvation call today. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The man has added all these other things to it that we must do and we must not do and we must be and not be. Yet we know that he just said, simply believe on him, and thou shalt be saved. Right. John 6, 37 says, And all that come to me, I will no wise cast out. Any that truly come to Christ in faith, he's not going to turn them away. Amen. That's, that's one thing that the sometimes the Arminian crowd throws against us. So if they're not elect, God's not going to save them. God's going to save his people. We can be sure of that. Amen. And any that come to Christ, he will, will in no wise cast out. Amen. Is it all in the previous part of that same verse? He says, All the Father give it to me, will come to me. That's it. We don't have to worry about accidentally getting someone to say that shouldn't be. We don't have to worry about that. We also have to fret over getting people saved because God will save 
who he's pleased to save. That's it. Corinthians gives us the, a good picture of that is that we are to plant and to water, but God is the one who gives the increase. We are to preach and witness and testify and, and tell others about Christ, but yet ultimately salvation must come from God. So it is unto all and upon all them that believe. So you, can, you can be sure if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved when you stand before him. And you will be righteous in the sight of God when you stand before him. But if you're trusting in something else, then you can be sure you, you will not have that righteousness. Rather, as we said, you'll stand there before God in your own righteousness, and that will fall far short. And he concludes this verse with, for there is no difference. Right. I don't know if it's a more of an American thing, but it seems like we tend to forget that no one is better than anyone else. Amen. That all men are wicked and depraved in the sight of God, and all are in need of a Savior. Is that? That there is no position or title or race or identity that one can hold that is any better than any other. And the same on the other side of that, it's none is any worse than the other either. But rather, we are all under sin, he says. Amen. We are all guilty before God. And the only thing that differentiates you and I from the most wicked of men is the grace of God. Amen. So we, we see Adolf Hitler as being some very wicked man, and yet, but for the grace of God, we would all be just as wicked. You're right. And really, in, in nature, we all are just as wicked. We just aren't. We just don't display that wickedness. Any lost person is just as wicked as any other. Amen. So sometimes that wickedness doesn't come out and display itself as as much as others do. We got deep down in our hearts, we are all without Christ, guilty and sinners in the sight of God. That should be a very humbling thought. Mm -hmm. It should be a call us to be very thankful that He has saved us. To just compare ourselves to what God requires for righteousness and think that He freely gave it to us on behalf of Christ. That that is much more than we could ever deserve or ever work our way to repay. Mm -hmm. Yet the only thing He says is, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Uh -huh. So there's multitudes of religions and Oh, churches today they're teaching you got to do all this other stuff and yet God in his word just simply says have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ Amen. Which really we don't need to complicate that any more than that we don't need to try to lessen it either it's not raise your hand or repeat this prayer after me it's not to do anything else it's not to repeat the ABCs of salvation. Right. It's to simply have faith in Christ. And what I know from the, from the scriptures, and I cannot have faith in Christ until God gives them this new life. And until God is pleased to bestow upon them that faith, but yet that doesn't change man's responsibility to believe on Lord Jesus Christ. And that really should be our message as God's people to Declare the gospel unto them. Point them to Christ, to tell them, leave on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And we'll, we should do the watering and the planting, and we should let God do the increasing. You know, I don't know whether Larry might testify to this more than I can, but a lot of times the Armenian type people are more they're worried about getting enough people saved. And get, right. We cannot do the saving. It must be of God. Amen. You're right. You know, the other end of the spectrum, the hard shells, I think, are sometimes worried they might get someone saved on accident. <laughs> and yet we know that God's only going to save those whom He will. That's it. That's right. You can be sure there's no difference, whether it's the mayor or whether it's a homeless man on the streets. Outside, of, unless they've been born again, they all stand in need of a Savior. Amen.
whether it's our fellow American citizens or whether it's some remote tribe down in South America, we all stand in need of a Savior. And all will stand guilty before God unless they have the righteousness of Christ applied to them. Amen. So we can close with that part.